Welcome. Um, my name is Thomas Bespin. I'm the resident writing consultant here at the CBS Library. Uh, today's going to be a little bit different than it usually is, but this is still the uh, Art of Learning uh, series, and I'll go through a little bit of the series in just a moment. Uh, and I'll, but I'll talk a little bit more about the other uh, talks as well. I want to do things a little different today. Uh, by starting with a short video clip uh, that's three, three and a half minutes-ish, uh, four on the outside. So uh, please pay attention. I found a closed captioned version of it, so it should be easy to follow along. It's an old documentary uh, of Bill Evans, uh, the jazz pianist, and his brother, Harry, talking to each other about how to develop as an artist, about how to develop as a musician specifically. Uh, but they do actually, and although in this clip it's not mentioned directly, uh, they do actually apply it to pretty much the development of any skill. So it's very important uh, that you don't think of this as just about piano, but there is some piano playing as well. Like I say, three or four minutes altogether. Uh, and I hope you'll enjoy it. I will make references to it. So that's why it's uh, useful that you see it. The, um, after this is all over, the of course, the video will uh, be up. I will not include the video in the, in the thing I put up on YouTube for all kinds of reasons, not only because it's bad quality, but I will put a link up to the whole documentary, which I, of course, uh, recommend that you watch if you, if you find the little clip uh, enjoyable, right? So here we go. Hopefully the technology will work. Uh, what do you think? Is it clear? There's a, the one thing that I really like about that particular scene. That particular scene is he plays three pieces of music. They're all good, right? There. I mean, he's obviously a talented pianist, and you can kind of see the point. One of them is just top flight, as he says. The other one is basic and very much within the framework of a of a novice, right? And then the other the the third one is this sort of sloppy attempt to um, simulate the top flight kind of uh, performance, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to uh, enjoy that simpler performance where you're working on something what he calls simple and real, right? Where you're working within a framework that you understand. And so you don't, as he says at the end, build on top of confusion, right? But that you build uh, on something you understand. That's the uh, that's the key, because that is going to be the key to enjoying the learning experience at a university and in higher education. It's really don't build on top of confusion. Don't pretend to be smarter than you really are. Work most of the time within a framework that you understand and improve from there. That's sort of the, the overall theme of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, with that, I will power the system down. So like I say, this is the uh, Art of Learning series. And um, what we do every time that we talk in this series is I draw an iceberg on the board. I try to sketch out where this all fits in to the larger framework. Uh, this goes quicker and quicker every time I do it, I hope. And yes, visible. And there we go. Um, the thing that I try to emphasize is that as Hemingway suggested, the dignity of the movement of an iceberg lies in only one eighth of it being above water. So that is to say the skills, the knowledge that you acquire, the learning that you do at university uh, indicates something below the surface. There is a competence that you have below the surface. We call this being knowledgeable, able to know, and enabled by that knowledge to do things you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Uh, so, so there's so our knowledge is a competence, and above the surface there is a performance of that competence. 
right? So we have something below the surface. Now, if Hemingway is right about this, we have much more below the surface than we are capable of demonstrating in any given time. And in fact, part of the part of the performance's sort of dignity, as he would put it, its integrity, its uh, persuasiveness, comes from the fact that there's a lot more. It indicates something uh, under the surface. That there is that sort of indication of something below the surface. Um, and like I say, we're going to call this all knowledge. And we're going to remember that we are knowledge able, enabled by this knowledge to do things and able to know other things. What are we enabled to do? We are better able to think than most people about the subjects that we're studying. We're better able to talk about those subjects, and we're certainly better able to write them down. And we've already had in this series a uh, talk on how to think, how to talk, and how to write. And all of these are available at the website. If you are signed up for this uh, session, you'll get a, a mail. I think that's been going working well, right? So you will get a mail and with links to the whole program, and you'll see the videos from the past sessions as well are there. Um, under way deep underneath these performances, there are comp other competencies that are sort of more silent, more implicit, uh, more tacit. Maybe you want to say things we don't demonstrate as as directly. Uh, so underneath our ability to write, which we demonstrate every time we write an assignment, of course, and submit it to our teachers, is clearly an ability to read. Right, and we've had a talk on how to read as well. There's, that's a competence we're developing. It's part of the art of learning in higher education. Uh, underneath the competence of being able to talk, so if you are a halfway competent speaker, uh, then you will usually find when you talk to people who are good at talking, that they're also capable of listening, that the competence that they manifest when they talk is connected to a, uh, uh, a receptivity as well. So they're able to listen. Uh, the reason that I want to emphasize uh, what is actually underneath the surface, what that competence looks like, uh, is that um, it ties into a framework for thinking about your competence overall and what you're really enjoying. What I what I've been what I said in the how to think talk. Well, how does knowledge help us to think? Well, it helps us to make up our minds. It helps us to form justified true beliefs about the world, right? It lets us go out and believe things that happen to be accurate and that we have good reasons to believe. Um, and the way I talked about it in the, how to in, in the how to think talk is that the content of our thought is propositional. So what we're able to do is to propose things. Right? We're able to claim, propose, suggest, argue that certain things are true. Right? We have a propositional attitude, if you will. Right? One of the things we become good at just standing there and saying, I think this is the case. Right? I think this is what is going on. Right? So we can propose things. And of course, we're open to criticism and so forth. Right? So we're, 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 we have a critical posture. Um, Likewise, remember that the capacity to talk is not just the capacity I hope I'm demonstrating right now, which is standing up in front of a crowd of people and just saying things. Uh, the real competence you want to have isn't just talking at people, it's conversation. So being knowledgeable at a university is the ability to converse intelligently with other knowledgeable people. Um, so it is a question of conversing. Right? You are conversant in your subject matter. You're able to participate in a conversation. Think about it in those terms. It's also something you can test just by talking to each other, to your fellow students and your peers. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the, the writing competence uh, is, of course, the ability to compose a coherent prose paragraph about something. So if you know something for academic purposes, you can compose a coherent prose paragraph. And we're going to talk about how to feel good about that. Uh, but to compose yourself, right? So in a slogan, uh, propose, converse, compose, right? A nice little uh, triad. Um, make up your mind, 
speak your mind, write it down. This is really what you want to be able to do as a, as a university student. And about all the things you learn something about, you want to have those capacities of having propositional content that you're conversant about and that you have some sort of compositional skill uh, related to. Good. Um, let's keep it simple and real. Uh, I've got sort of three major themes and you'll see it's quite uh, easy to, to uh, understand the organization of this. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, finding enjoyment in the past. So if you think about this on a timeline, finding enjoyment in the past, um, you know where this is going, in the future, and of course in the present. So how are we going to feel good about learning, understanding that it's a process? Remember that's the, the message that Bill Evans has, is if you don't understand, it's a process. If you don't have some sense of the length of the journey in the mind from of the, the length of the journey in mind from the beginning, then you're going to uh, give yourself needless frustrations because you're just not seeing that what you're doing right now is the right thing and uh, worth taking pleasure in. Um, and I guess we'll just do this in order, right? So uh, what what do we what are we going to find here in the past? Um, well, there's going to be some sense of process. I'm going to do this in a different color. It's going to be some sense of process. Right? There's lots of activities that you're going to be engaged in. And what you want to do as you're engaging in these activities is you want to derive satisfaction from the progress that you have made, right? This, your, the sense that you are progressing. We sometimes forget to do this, but always think back to last semester, last year, uh, look back a little, maybe even keep some of your old assignments around, read them and recognize that you are getting smarter and you are progressing, right? And then what you want to do is derive satisfaction from that process. So the, the key word for our source of pleasure here, pleasure in the process is going to be satisfaction. And uh, Walt Whitman has a great way of putting this. I probably mentioned this in the How to Think talk as well. Uh, whatever satisfies the soul is truth. Right? So when you are uh, trying to think things through, trying to make up your mind what is true, when you hit it, right? when you do get to the point where you say, you know, I think I know what's true, um, and I understand it now, then take some satisfaction in that, count that, count that win and take some satisfaction in it. So what you want to do is be able to derive satisfaction in the process. Now, I have just been involved in a somewhat heated debate on Twitter to, uh, yesterday and today uh, about grading, because there are uh, lots of people who are very kind, very caring people uh, involved in education who are opposed to grading. Uh, they think grading is a bad idea. Uh, so there's a movement afoot in higher education and other levels of education called ungrading, where we would want to replace the idea of giving you grades with um, just getting feedback, constructive feedback, of course, advice for how to improve, but not to judge your performance. Now, I do actually do this in my workshops. Uh, when we do writing workshops, I, t I t tell people, participants in the workshops to um, read each other's work out loud to each other. And so I would, you would write something and another student would read it out loud to you and they would reflect a little bit about it. They would answer some questions about it. And I always say, don't take this as a judgment, take it as an experience, right? If you're being read, experience being read, don't think of it as being judged. And I always say to the, the reader, try not to judge, not even favorably. Don't say it's interesting. Don't say it's hard to read. Don't say it's clearly written. Like, don't say positive or negative things about it, right? Just react to it thinkingly as a reader, 
right? React to it at the level of its content and then let the writer decide whether or not that was the sort of reaction they wanted. And then they can go back and like, so there is that, that there's that whole idea of recognizing that sometimes getting judged, feeling judged is a source of displeasure with higher education. This whole grading process can, can get in the way of the pleasure that we get out of education. Um, there's lots of studies, of course, in social psychology about uh, extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. That if we, if and many of you probably, because you have succeeded in your disciplines by getting to the level you're at now, right? Uh, so you have this experience of starting out being interested in a subject and then even being rewarded very positively for it with very good grades. This might have reduced your motivation, your intrinsic motivation. There's a, a kind of dissonance between being rewarded for something we already found enjoyable. And there's lots of studies that have uh, demonstrated this. We could probably talk about the quality of those studies. We're not going to. Uh, but there, it, it makes sense, right? That if you take somebody that is doing something for pleasure and then you start giving them, you start paying them for it or rewarding them for it, then this can interfere with their enjoyment of that. Now, my argument would be that we're not going to change that anytime soon uh, in the university system. You will be given grades. You will be rewarded even for things that you take pleasure in, that you do for the fun of it, for your own benefit, right? And the whole trick here is to recognize that that could interfere with your learning and it could interfere with your enjoyment and then take it in stride, face that issue squarely and say, look, I'm gonna take the grade. Good grade or bad grade, doesn't matter. I'm gonna take it, right? Um, think about it in these terms. And this is, uh, I've, for a long time, I have tried to suggest to educators, to teachers, that we should make an argument that we should grade everybody on a curve. Uh, by grading on a curve, we mean relative grading or competitive grading. There should only be so and so many A's or 12s in Denmark, so and so many B's or 10s and so forth. Uh, and we should compete for them, right? Now, I'm not, making, I'm not saying that happens now because it, it's not allowed. It's illegal in this country to grade you competitively. We can't compare student performances to give grades. But what's interesting is if you read the guidance from the government on this, uh, they say, but we expect a normal distribution of the grades. So although you're not allowed to actually have competitive grading, what is expected is a normal distribution. And there's all kinds of issues with grade inflation and so forth. So what you wanna do is keep this in mind that in an ideal world, in an ideal system, right? It would look like this. And this is exactly how uh, it is generally suggested, uh, I think, for the sake of normalcy. Oh, I have to move this as well. For the sake of normal, I think we want to put the high grades over here. So there would be 12s over here. There would be twos and zeros over here, right? Uh, and the idea, 10, 7, and 4s, and the idea according to the the standard guidance is that you would have 10% at the very uh, high and low ends. So you would have 10% twos and 10% 12s. You would then have 25%, you would have 25%, and you would then have 30% sevens right in the middle, right? It's roughly that kind of distribution that, uh, that the that the uh, ministerial guidance is looking for when uh, they uh, made this grading system. That's the ideal world. Uh, today, actually, it is skewed to the top. Uh, so there is some issues there, and they're, of course, widely discussed in the media and so forth. Uh, we give, we tend to give grades that are too high compared to this ideal system. But here's the thing. Uh, when you get your grade, try to think of it as normalized. Try to think of getting a grade as a completely normal activity. Uh, and what it's telling you is roughly how good you are, how well you've understood the material compared to your cohort, so the other people who are taking the course or who are in the program that you're in. And then remember that 12s are rare. And 10s and 7s are 55% 
of the total amount of grades, ideally. So getting a 10 or getting a seven is perfectly fine. It's really normal. It's a good place to be. You're well on your way. There's room for improvement, right? The question isn't, how am I getting judged? The question isn't, what is this saying about me? The question is just moving forward. What am I going to do, right? So try to normalize the experience of getting graded. It is fine. And of course, if you're very ambitious and you want to get up here, you're going to have to work harder, but you're going to have to work harder in a way that you find pleasure in, that you find enjoyment in. Right? Not enjoying it is not going to help you. That's the uh, that's the argument that I want to make. So always think of grading as an as as this sort of arbitrary, imposed, comparative system. And we can't all be here because, ideally, by definition, the exams would be set up in such a way that only ten percent, at the end of a perfectly normal class our semester, only 10% would actually be capable of getting those 12s, right? So we can't all have them. So it's perfectly normal to be distributed, right? If you can get comfortable with that, you can relax into that and just say, that's fine. Uh, then you are in a position to enjoy your learning and progress towards those 12s, right? That's uh, part of, the, part of the, the fun of it. Uh, it's just normal competition. Uh, I do have a blog post about this, and I'll make sure I link to it in the notes. Um, that uh, one thing I discovered a while back is that uh, the word competence is actually rooted in the same root as compete. Uh, it is actually a question of so if you're competent, you're always getting better. To be good at something is always to be better at it. Uh, and of course, what you want to do is be competing with yourself. You want to make sure you are always the one that's getting better. Don't worry about whether you're getting better than the guy next to you, right? Worry about whether you're better than you were six months ago, right? That's really the improvement you're looking for, right? Uh, and then you can find pleasure in it, right? Um, some general strategies in this process here. Um, as you're going along and you're looking for satisfaction, remember that there's all these activities. You're going to be thinking, talking, writing. You'll be listening. You'll be reading. All of those things are happening. Uh, remember to alternate between them. So you're not spending weeks and weeks just listening and not doing any reading or writing, like just going to lectures, just listening and talking. Alternate through them, um, preferably so that you're doing almost all of them every day. Right? You're making up your mind about things. You are writing them down. You're talking about them. You're sitting there listening in your lectures. You're reading books about them. Uh, alternate so that all of these things are done every day, right? It's, it's a process and you're not going to succeed absolutely at any given time. So just work on it for a little bit and then shift your footing. Um, and with that image in mind, one thing that I will just recommend that maybe we don't do enough of, I'm sure many of you have um, discipline sort of exercise regimes and you sort of, you keep yourself in shape and so forth, right? But do you just go for a walk, <laughs> right? Uh, so this uh, last weekend, I went for a walk with a friend out at uh, Hasco up north of here. Uh, it was a little bit uh, wet, it rained in the morning, but it wasn't raining during the day. Beautiful colors, just beautiful fall uh, walk in the woods. We walked 15 kilometers talking and of course not always talking all the time, but um, walking and talking and so forth. Uh, remember that walking, uh, again, this is maybe that sort of dubious science. Walking is uh, you shift uh, your left and right feet all the time. And because you're shifting your left and right feet, you're shifting your left and your right brain. Uh, so it's really good for your brain to just walk while you're thinking and talking about stuff uh, instead of just sitting there. Right? I don't know if that's true, but it makes sense, right? It's pretty plausible. Uh, so do uh, do keep that in mind. Um, it's very uh, very useful. I have one. It's all good. It's all good. Um, go for walks. It doesn't have to be 15K on the weekend. It can just be three or four. Flex Bejeo is just right over here. Also a beautiful place to go for a walk with your thoughts every once in a while. It's part of the process. And I would really recommend it if you want to get some pleasure out of learning. Ancient, tried, and true. So let's move towards the uh, present. Um, 
And uh, this is really, I would say, this is sort of my darling, if you will. This is something that I really emphasize, is that if you are working in a disciplined way, then you're able to seize the moment, as it were. Uh, and this is really, our key word here is going to be actual pleasure. So take satisfaction in the process by keeping your sense of the scope of it, right? Keeping your sense of the stakes and all that, and it's an ongoing process, and it's basically a statistical thing. Uh, but in the moment, you want to take real pleasure in what's actually going on, right? You want to find a way of taking pleasure in the moment. Uh, my son will not mind me saying this. Um, I always tell him when he's doing the dishes that when he gets really good at it, he'll enjoy it, right? Being good at something is being able to find ways of enjoying it. Uh, so when if there is something that doesn't give you direct immediate pleasure right remember okay maybe that's not maybe that's not something wrong with a thing maybe i'm just not doing it right i'm not good at it yet and once i get good at it i will find the pleasure in this i will find a way of enjoying reading this kind of paper or doing this kind of calculation right or working out this kind of problem right this is this is something that i'm going to eventually get uh, find the the pleasure in um, <clears throat> that goes for certainly for reading and writing. Um, I don't, I, I, I'm going to let myself swear by quoting a movie. Uh, that's the way we get away with it. Uh, there's a great movie with, uh, Matt Damon called the Martian where he, uh, is stranded, uh, on Mars. Uh, and he's, of course, he's a scientist. So he says, I'm going to science the shit out of this problem. Uh, and that's how he's going to get himself off Mars. Uh, one of the things I really suggest when you are learning is give yourself moments, especially when you're writing, of course, because I'm a writing uh, consultant, give yourself moments where you can just sit down and just know the shit out of things for 30 minutes, right? 27 minutes is ideal. 18 or 27 minutes at a time is really the sort of thing that way to put it. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to do just quickly is just get is give you a sense of how that frame works. Um, let's go over here. I should have given myself room. I will go over here. Imagine that this was over here where it was supposed to be. Uh, so in the present moment, uh, what you want to do is say, I'm going to limit this thing. Uh, this moment that I'm in, in space and time in such a way that I give myself the resources I need to enjoy it. I'm not going to rush myself into a learning moment. I'm not going to feel like I have to get this over with and then move on to the next thing. I'm going to sort of coordinate off and make it a, a nice, safe, comfortable space for learning. Uh, so one of the things you want to do is put a door on it. And remember, I've said this before and related to the writing process, is that a door is a social construction. It's not necessarily something you can lock. It's not even necessarily something that's physically in the way of people getting to you. Uh, it's just sort of a boundary around you that people have to ask whether they can cross. So my office door, right, is not locked. People knock on it. I say, come on in. And then they ask politely, can I disturb you? And then I can choose. I can say, well, actually, right now is not a good time because I'm in the middle of something. Uh, can you come back in 15 minutes? Right? So it's, it's, it's just a boundary across which we have some etiquette. We have some politeness. And if you can enforce that boundary in a polite way, uh, then you will be able to derive more pleasure out of that moment because you know that once the door is closed, whether that's because you're sitting in the library at a, at a study space or because you're in your in your apartment, in your house, and you're in your room, uh, or you're sitting at the table and the people around you know to leave you alone for a while, right? then you get this space to concentrate in. It's a social contract, right? Just maintain that. It also means that if you say, I need an hour to work, leave me alone for an hour, then you are obligated to your surroundings to rejoin them after that hour, right? Because otherwise they will come looking for you Right, and uh, try to draw you back into life. Right? Come back to the world, they will say. Uh, so develop a good habit of going in behind that door, however metaphorical it is, going behind that door, close it, 
do your thing and then return, right? And do it in a timed way. Um, the other thing you want to do is to separate out the space uh, in which you read and the space in which you write. So I normally say, here's the bookshelf, there's the desk. If you are writing, sit down on, at the desk and write. If you are reading, you maybe you have a comfortable reading chair over here, right? pick a book off the shelf, sit down and read. Of course, you're allowed to take the book to the desk if you prefer to sit upright with your notes and so forth. I'm not saying you have to sit in a comfy chair to read, uh, but do it in whatever way you do it, in wh whatever way you ritualize it, make sure you're giving yourself these moments where for these next 27 minutes, what I'm doing is reading a book. For these next 20 minutes, what I'm doing is I'm writing a paragraph, right? Um, and then if it is a writing moment you're talking about, then I have some very, very specific advice, which is divide it into two minutes. So let's say you start at eight o'clock, divide it into two minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and five minutes, All right? Make sure you have activities for the first two minutes, like work on your key sentence, have 10 minutes of your generating ideas, writing sentences that support, elaborate, or defend those that key sentence then shift into a more of a compositional mode, an editing mode where you're turning it into a nice clean paragraph. So it's gonna start looking like something on the page, right? It's gonna look like an actual paragraph on the page. You'll spend about 10 minutes doing that work, right? Taking pleasure in that. Uh, then you'll read it out loud and you'll take pleasure in that. You'll do it with feeling. You'll read it with the uh, intention, with the meaning that you wanted this text to have. You're going to try to sort of perform what should be going on in your reader's mind because these ideas are formed and uh, give you some pleasure. Uh, and then let your vanity work for about three minutes. Fixing it, polishing it, giving it really that kind of shape, right? Making it a pretty paragraph, pleasing paragraph. I've just written a series of posts about the sort of the ideal paper, the ideal paragraph, the ideal sentence, uh, the, per, the, uh, the right word, and neat handwriting and typography, right? So you're worried about what should the font be? What should the line spacing be? How should this look on the page? Take some pleasure in that, those sorts of aesthetic things about your writing. Uh, and then take a three minute break. And this is actually one of the things that I really, will stress there will be also a link to it. It's what I call discipline zero. I will put it over here actually, discipline zero. Um, what you need to do if you want to enjoy any of these activities, any of these sort of moments of learning is you need to know how to stop, not because you were satisfied. Satisfaction is of the process, right? Uh, so you may not be satisfied. You may not feel you're done but you stop because you said you would. And like I say, you promise to return to the world. So you're gonna, what you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're gonna stop, take a three minute break, do nothing, do some shoulder exercises, maybe walk around the room a little bit, right? Just sort of clear your head and then get on with your day. Uh, put in a, teach yourself that you're in control of these moments. You, you start them, you establish them, and you're the one that shuts them down. It's not something that happens external to you. It's something you're in control of. And you'll do that uh, best if you practice this discipline of stopping. Uh, you would think that the hard thing motivationally is to get started. But the, uh, the usually the, the real discipline, once you are immersed in something that, that interests you, the discipline is stopping. Right? The discipline is... Uh, stopping while you feel some strength still, and you're still you still feel smart, you still feel intelligent. You're not exhausted yet. You actually feel like you should keep going. Stop and and work on it again tomorrow. That kind of discipline is what will take you through and and help you find pleasure in things as you go. Uh, some one of the most tragic things that happens um, in higher education is people who are very interested in a subject at the beginning, uh, but then because of the way they work, they end up exhausting themselves uh, and they don't know that they have completed the work they needed to do until they feel completely worn out, feel, until they feel completely exhausted. That's the only way they know they've done enough on a particular assignment is, well, I stayed up all night and I'm totally exhausted and I 
right? And I hate this subject now, right? Uh, so I must be doing it right. You know, I must, my, I must have given it my all. I gave everything to it, right? Uh, and that's a tragedy because then you end up getting a good grade, right? you end up even getting a degree, but you no longer like the subject. Uh, and you don't want to get yourself in that situation. What you want to do is get yourself in a situation where you worked at it with a reasonable amount of effort all the way through. And so you come out of it qualified, still interested, and with a sense of how to enjoy it. Right? That's how you want to be working at it. Um, good. So keep that in mind. The, uh, the process, satisfaction is of the process. Uh, pleasure is of the moment. Um, what about the future? Um, um, oh, yes, the future is going to be your career. Somehow, this process through the series of moments is going to lead to some kind of career. And of course, it will not necessarily be an academic career, right? This is a business school. We do pride ourselves in being relevant to the modern workplace, right? So we are qualifying you to getting jobs in the real world, as they say. Um, and what you want to do is aim for um, facing that. So the, the thing that sort of um, is at the same level as satisfaction and pleasure uh, is confidence, right? You want to make sure that the way you're working, the way you're organizing your process and the moments you're having, the learning moments you're having uh, as you go, give you confidence in the future. Right? So that as you go forward and as you imagine the future, you imagine it confidently and calmly. You don't imagine it as a very scary, very uncertain place. You certainly imagine it as a scary and uncertain place in the way that the media tells you, right? There's all kinds of things, all kinds of crises that you will have to face. Um, but you're going to go into those crises with confidence because you've been very deliberate in building up a set of skills that you need to, to face them. Um, keep in mind that... Uh, the confidence you have in the future has something to do with the goals you set yourself and the level of ambition you have. Right? You have to make sure that you have that you've sort of adjusted your goals and ambitions to what you've learned about yourself. Right? You don't want to have ambitions that would force you to do things in the moment that constantly give you pain rather than pleasure. Right. You want to make sure that your ambition is actually to continue this process through these moments. Right. Make sure that you have a have some sense that this career that you're looking for is going to also be enjoyable, also going to give you some pleasure. Um, so that's that's really important. And then remember what Bill Evans says: from the very beginning, you start with a realistic point of view. So you say. Yes, there are these people who are geniuses in my discipline, right? There are these people who are just brilliant. And there are, of course, people who are wildly successful. I don't know who your favorite billionaire is. There's lots of billionaires to choose from these days. They're almost a dime a dozen, really. Uh, so there's lots of very successful people. And you can choose the ones that are most impressive to you. Uh, but of course, you don't have to become a billionaire, right? That's, that isn't necessarily the goal. Um, what you want to do is say, well, what, what did they do day in and day out that they enjoyed and found meaningful that I can do day in and day out? And even if I don't become a billionaire, that's going to be a pretty good life, right? That's going to be a pretty good career, right? Uh, and then, yes, if I'm super lucky and everything just works out exactly right, then I will also become fantastically wealthy, right? But you want to make sure that the, the process itself is one that you're deriving pleasure from, not the end goal. Right? Um, that's what's going to give you confidence uh, in the future, uh, that realistic point of view. Um, so that's really, that's, I feel like that was a pretty nice arc. Uh, I always like holding these talks because I end up seeing what I say. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll leave it there. I, the 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 thing I wanted to leave you with at the end uh, is uh, not to uh, underestimate the length of the journey 
Uh, and then remember that at the end of the day, this isn't just about pleasure, right? So the philosopher in me says, you know, we, we're not just hedonists. So it's not just about deriving pleasure. Uh, it is literally about being happy. It's about finding happiness. Uh, the Greek philosophical word for this is eudaimonia, right? So a kind of a, a deep uh, happiness, uh, a, a goodness of spirit, uh, as I believe a good translation of that. Uh, so what you want to do is find that kind of actual uh, base of happiness and work from. And uh, one of the, I don't want to say least happy, but one of the most experienced uh, people that I know of as far as being unhappy and uh, dealing with that situation is a uh, English uh, critic named Cyril Connolly, who wrote a little book many years ago. Uh, it came out in 1945. Um, called The Unquiet Grave. And in that he uh, says something I, which I think is profoundly true, profoundly true, and it is a profundity. Uh, so and you can look it up. Um, he says uh, that true happiness uh, comes from freedom from anxiety. Uh, we could even just say freedom from worry or anxiety, uh, that kind of thing. Freedom from, uh, from angst, uh, as we say in Danish. So not just fear, right? Sometimes we're afraid, well, that can be good, I can actually have an enemy. It's that sort of free-floating anxiety, that sort of worry and concern. That's what you want to be free from. And then he says there's really only three activities that are reliably anxiety-free. Uh, and this is something I've paid attention to. It's really, really important to keep in mind. There are things you can do that are reliably, almost automatically guaranteeing you that you will be uh, free from anxiety. Uh, the first is communion with nature. Uh, so go for a walk in the woods. Right? As soon as you get away from a few steps away from your car or the train, right, and you realize now I'm maybe half an hour or an hour away from civilization, uh, you can't do anything about your life anymore. right? You're an hour away from doing anything with it. So you suddenly realize, oh, so I'm what's here? Now nature is here, right? And you realize I'm part of it. I actually belong in this place called nature. So this world is actually, we are actually getting along, especially if you go to a nice place like a park or you know, the woods. Um, so do that. Commune with nature, right? That's a reliable release from anxiety. Uh, the um, And of course, I'm not talking about any sort of clinical level of anxiety. I'm just talking about that sort of ordinary free-floating anxiety that we're familiar with. Um, the other one is creative work. And that's really what's going on here in these present moments of, of pleasure. Right? If you can give yourself creative work, he says, you know, when you're writing a poem, you are outside of space and time. Right? Uh, your brain is functioning fully. Uh, that's so he, that's how he would, he would go with poetry, but any kind of creative work, doing a calculation, working out a problem, uh, reading something interesting, right? Writing, these can all be creative activities uh, that when you're immersed in them, right, when you are actually occupied, your attention is occupied by them, you are uh, being released from anxiety and feeling this happiness. And then there's the last one, which is just brilliant, I think. So remember, communion with nature, creative work, and helping others. Right? Think, think about what happens when a friend uh, calls you up and says, I need help. Uh, I'm moving. I need your help. Right? So you show up, and because you have no responsibility for planning this move, right? all you are is you're there to lift things up and down those stairs. Every time you do anything, you're just contributing. Right? You're unproblematically making a contribution. And you are in those moments when you know for sure that you are helping, right? and you are helping them do, accomplish the goal that they're trying to accomplish. In those moments, you are completely released from worry and anxiety about anything else because your time is now well spent. It's just serving somebody else, right? Uh, it's not the same thing as showing up for work and getting paid. You're not helping others, right? That's that's a, That can be a very anxiety-provoking situation. Uh, but when you're just voluntarily helping somebody else, right? You are, in those moments, free from anxiety and you can seek them out. Right? Um, so keep that in mind. Commune with nature, creative work, help others. Do that regularly as part of your process. That'll be part of what's going to give you the confidence you need, the satisfaction you had, and the uh, 
pleasure of the moment, right? And overall happiness. I hope that was edifying. I, you know, this is probably the one that's the, the grooviest of the talks. So I hope it, uh, I hope it worked.